China's stealth duo J-36 and H-20R stress testing Pentagon A defense planning, and the concern did not begin with a launch or parade. It surfaced quietly inside U.S. planning rooms, where assumptions about distance and laid defense started to feel thinner than expected. Analysts were not reacting to a single aircraft, but to how two platforms might operate together. That shift is forcing planners to price in scenarios they once assumed would never matter. So what exactly changed? What are these aircraft designed to do inside China's warfighting doctrine? And why does their pairing apply pressure even before full deployment? To understand that, we need to step back and look at how air combat itself is being rethought and why coordination now matters more than any single platform. For decades, air combat planning followed a familiar logic. Fighters protected themselves. Bombers relied on escorts or distance. Sensors fed pilots information, but decision-making stayed largely human and local. Even stealth aircraft were still treated as individual assets that survived by avoiding detection. That framework is now breaking down. There is no official rulebook that defines what a sixth-generation aircraft must be. No alliance has published a checklist. But across the United States, Europe, and Asia, air forces are converging on the same conclusion. Fifth-generation aircraft are reaching their limits in two areas that matter most in future conflict. Surviving inside dense air defense networks and managing the sheer volume of sensors, drones, and long-range weapons now present in modern battle space. The shift is subtle but decisive. Fifth-generation aircraft were designed to look after themselves. Sixth-generation concepts assume the aircraft is only one node in a much larger system. It must collect data from many sources, filter it, and act as a coordinator rather than a lone shooter. This is why data fusion has become central. Modern air combat is no longer about who sees first on a radar screen. It is about who can combine radar returns, infrared tracking, electronic signals, and offboard sensor feeds into a usable picture without overwhelming the crew. When that fusion fails, even the most advanced aircraft becomes a liability rather than an advantage. Stealth has also changed meaning. Reducing radar signature is still essential, but it is no longer enough. Aircraft must manage infrared output, electronic emissions, and vulnerability to jamming or cyber interference. In environments saturated with sensors, remaining difficult to track across multiple domains matters more than achieving near invisibility in one. Range and endurance now play a different role as well. Instead of pushing aircraft deep into defended airspace, modern concepts favor staying outside the most dangerous zones while reaching in with long-range weapons and coordinated unmanned systems. That approach trades raw penetration for persistence and control. This is where planning pressure begins to build for defenders. When combat aircraft are designed to manage swarms, relay targeting data, and operate across wide distances, a defense is no longer reacting to individual tracks. It is reacting to networks that adapt, reposition, and probe for weaknesses over time. Understanding this shift is critical because it explains why attention is now focused less on individual performance claims and more on how platforms are meant to work together. With that context in place, the design choices behind China's J-36 stopped looking accidental. When analysts first began sketching the J-36 based on satellite images and early photos, the aircraft stood out immediately, not because it looked fast or agile, but because it looked large and deliberate. The shape suggests endurance and control rather than close combat. That alone hints at its intended role. The blended wing body design reduces exposed edges that radar systems rely on, especially at lower frequencies. The absence of vertical tails and canards further limits radar reflections from multiple angles. This is not a design optimized for airshow maneuvering. It is optimized to remain difficult to track while staying on station for long periods. One of the most debated features is the three-engine layout. This adds weight and complexity, but it also solves a growing problem in modern air combat. Power, advanced sensors, large active radar arrays, high bandwidth data links, and electronic warfare systems all demand electrical output. A platform meant to coordinate multiple unmanned systems cannot afford power limits. Three engines provide margin, both for thrust and for sustained electrical generation. The cockpit arrangement reinforces this role. Instead of a single pilot managing everything, the J-36 appears to use a side-by-side -side two-seat layout. One crew member focuses on flight control, navigation, and survival. The other manages sensors, targets, and unmanned systems. This reflects a practical judgment. The volume of information in modern combat already exceeds what one person can process effectively, even with automation support. 
This approach mirrors concepts discussed openly by the USA Force under the Collaborative Combat Aircraft Program. The difference lies in how the burden is split. American designs lean heavily on software and artificial intelligence to reduce pilot workload. China appears more willing to retain a second human decision maker, even if that choice slightly compromises ideal stealth geometry. Operationally, the J-36 is not meant to spearhead attacks into the densest air defense zones. Instead, it is designed to remain outside the most dangerous envelopes while directing drones and long-range weapons forward. From that position, it can hunt high-value targets such as airborne early warning aircraft, tankers, or command platforms using very long-range missiles, while its unmanned partners absorb risk. It is important to be clear about limits. The J-36 remains a prototype. Public imagery shows unfinished surfaces, evolving intake designs, and ongoing test changes. There is no evidence it matches the maturity or reliability of current U.S. stealth aircraft. But for planners, capability does not need to be perfect to be disruptive. It only needs to be credible enough to force adaptation. That brings us to the next layer of the problem. Coordinating the fight from the air is one thing. Applying pressure far beyond the front line is another. This is where the second half of the stealth pairing comes into view. If the J-36 is designed to coordinate the fight, the H-20 is meant to apply pressure where defenders least want it. To understand why that matters, it helps to look at where China's bomber force came from and why the H-20 represents a break from that past. For decades, China relied on the H-6, a design rooted in the Soviet era. Over time, that aircraft was adapted into a long-range missile carrier, extending China's reach without changing the basic logic of how bombers were used. Distance and standoff weapons compensated for limited survivability. The focus remained regional. The H-20 changes that logic. Rather than a traditional fuselage and wing layout, the H-20 is described as a flying wing stealth bomber, similar in overall concept to the American B-2 and B-21. This configuration minimizes radar reflections and allows long-range flight while carrying internal weapons. The intent is clay. Strike from deep inside the Pacific without exposing the aircraft to the densest coastal defenses. Public estimates cited in Pentagon reporting place the H-20's potential range around 10,000 kilometers, especially when paired with aerial refueling. On paper, that puts locations like Guam and potentially even Hawaii within reach. Whether those figures are achieved in practice remains unknown, but planning cannot ignore the possibility. Building a flying wing stealth bomber is not simply a matter of shape. It requires precision manufacturing, advanced materials, and extremely demanding maintenance practices. Even the United States needed decades to turn the B-2 into a reliable operational system. China is attempting to compress that loaning curve through digital design and industrial experience gained from civil aviation programs. So far, there is no confirmed imagery of an operational H-20 in flight. What exists are models, animations, and limited hints from official statements. That uncertainty cuts both ways. It leaves room for skepticism, but it also leaves room for caution. A defense planning cannot assume immaturity equals irrelevance. What matters most is not whether the H-20 can perfectly replicate American stealth bombers. It is whether it can force defenders to treat rear area bases as exposed. Even partial stealth capability, combined with long-range weapons, complicates radar coverage, interceptor allocation, and base hardening decisions. Another factor is experience. The United States has decades of operational history planning and executing long-range bomber missions. China does not. That gap affects reliability, crew training, and mission confidence. But experience is accumulated, not inherited. The existence of the H-20 program signals intent to close that gap over time. This brings us back to the core issue. A long-range bomber does not need to fly every mission to shape strategy. Its presence alone forces defenders to plan for the possibility. And when that bomber is paired with airborne coordination platforms operating further forward, the pressure multiplies. Understanding that interaction is key, because neither aircraft was designed to operate alone. The real stress on air defense emerges when they appear on the same map. Looking at the J-36 or the H-20 in isolation misses the point. Neither aircraft was designed to solve China's air power problem alone. The pressure on USA defense planning comes from how these platforms are intended to operate as part of a laid system. In Chinese operational thinking, air combat is not framed as a sequence of isolated duels. It is framed as a contest between systems. Sensors, command nodes, aircraft, drones, and missiles are expected to work together, each extending the reach of the others. 
The J36 and H20 fit into that logic as complementary tools. Closer to contested airspace, aircraft like the J20 are expected to manage near-range air threats and protect key elements of the formation. Further out, the J36 operates as a coordinator. From a position outside the densest defensive zones, it manages unmanned aircraft, distributes sensor data, and directs long-range weapons. Its job is not to break defenses directly, but to stretch them, probe them, and force reactions. Behind that outer activity, the H-20 provides depth. It does not need to approach the front line to matter. Its value lies in the uncertainty it creates. If a stealth bomber can approach from unexpected vectors and threaten re-area targets, defenders lose the luxury of focusing resources only at the edge of the battle space. This laid approach complicates every part of air defense planning. Radar coverage must extend further and cover more angles. Interceptors must be held in reserve for threats that may never appear, while still responding to those that do. Bases must be hardened, dispersed, or both, increasing cost and reducing efficiency. For planners, that translates into immediate trade-offs. More radar coverage means fewer interceptors elsewhere. More hardened bases mean fewer deployable forces. Every layer added to protect depth quietly pulls resources away from the front. Even if coordination between these platforms is imperfect, defenders cannot assume failure. Planning must account for the most dangerous plausible case, not the most convenient one. That alone increases strain. Air defense becomes a problem of endurance rather than interception. Another factor is cost asymmetry. Expanding radar networks, deploying additional interceptors, and hardening infrastructure requires long-term investment. The platforms applying pressure do not need to achieve dominance to succeed. They only need to make defense more expensive and less predictable. This is why analysts focus less on performance parity and more on operational effect. The question is not whether China's stealth platforms are equal to their American counterparts today. The question is whether their combined presence forces changes in how the United States allocates resources across the Pacific. When air defense planning shifts from protecting the front to protecting everything, the balance of effort changes. That shift is already visible in how planners discuss basing, logistics, and redundancy. And that leads directly to the next issue. If this pairing does not need to be perfect to be effective, how much capability is enough to force real change? At this point, it is tempting to reduce the story to a comparison. J-36 versus F-47. H-20 versus B-21. Line up specifications, count advantages, and declare a winner. That approach misses how air defense stress actually works. From a planning perspective, parity is not required. What matters is whether a capability is credible enough to force defensive change. If defenders must assume a threat could succeed, resources must be allocated to counter it, even if that threat is imperfect. The United States has spent decades refining stealth operations. Its bomber force benefits from mature maintenance systems, trained crews, and extensive operational experience. China does not yet have that depth, but experience grows with use and design intent matters even before full maturity is reached. The J-36 does not need to match the stealth performance of future American fighters. It only needs to be difficult enough to track while managing unmanned systems that absorb risk and extend reach. The H-20 does not need to operate at the same tempo as a B-21. It only needs enough range and survivability to make planners treat re-area bases as exposed. This creates an uneven cost equation. Defensive systems are expensive to expand and maintain. Offense only needs to create doubt. Defense has to pay to remove it. Radar coverage, interceptor stocks, hardened shelters, fuel dispersion, and redundancy all require sustained investment. Offense benefits when defense must protect more locations with finite resources. This imbalance is what planners focus on. The concern is not sudden defeat, but long-term pressure. Each additional layer of defense consumes budget, attention, and manpower. Over time, that pressure shapes force posture even without combat. Another factor is uncertainty. A defense planning cannot rely on optimistic assumptions. It must prepare for worst-case scenarios that are technically plausible. That means planning for coordination between aircraft, drones, and long-range weapons even if that coordination has not been demonstrated in conflict. In this sense, the J-36 and H-20 function as planning tools as much as weapons. Their existence shapes decisions today not just potential battles tomorrow. And that brings the story to its most uncomfortable point. When planners talk about air defense, the focus often lands on interceptors and sensors. 
But the real challenge exposed by this pairing runs deeper. It touches basing strategy, logistics, and the ability to sustain operations under pressure. Protecting forward forces has always been difficult. Protecting rear area infrastructure is even harder. Fuel farms, ammunition depots, runways, and command centers are not easily hidden or replaced. Once they are treated as vulnerable, everything from deployment timelines to sortie rates is affected. There are only a few ways to respond. Bases can be hardened, which is costly and slow. Forces can be dispersed, which reduces efficiency. New sensors and interceptors can be deployed, which adds complexity and strain. None of these options offers a clean solution. This is why the stress caused by the J-36 and H-20 pairing is not technical alone. It is strategic. It forces choices about where to accept risk and where to spend limited resources. Those choices must be made long before any conflict begins. The United States still holds significant advantages in experience, integration, and global reach. But advantage does not remove pressure. It only changes how that pressure is managed. Seen this way, the emergence of China's stealth duo is not a sudden shift in balance. It is a slow tightening of constraints. Each year of development narrows planning margins and raises the cost of maintaining dominance. So the real question is not whether these aircraft are ready today. It is whether their continued progress is already forcing air defense planners to spend time and money differently than they plan to. If something has to change first, should it be the aircraft, the bases, or the strategy holding them together?